anger against what we believed was unnecessary American intervention in other people's affairs. And Nixon was one of the symbols of this. I still remember the blockade of the Haifang Harbor in Vietnam. And that day, the anger and the emotion I felt about what I thought was the senseless and provocative act of that kind. But when I look back, what Nixon did was really minor misdemeanor. On his behalf, but without his knowledge, somebody in the committee to the president authorized the burglary of a hotel very stupidly, ill advised it because it was not necessary. Nixon was anyway winning by a landslide. They authorized the burglary in the hope that they would find something compromising about the opposition candidate. At the time, George McGovern was the candidate of the Democratic Party. But when the burglary happened, he was not yet the candidate. They hoped that the Democratic National Convention would reveal something that they could use in the electoral process. As luck would have it, an African-American janitor, he caught the burglars. And as luck would have it, two intrepid journalists, Carl Benstein and Bob Woodward, they followed the events in the court and in the White House with meticulous precision and with courage and perseverance. And eventually, they failed the president because the president did simply only one thing. Even after he came to know about it, he condoned a cover-up. He did nothing more. He just kept quiet about the cover-up of the investigation of the Watergate burglary. And a mighty president had to lose office. That was, if I remember, the 8th of August, 1974. Around the same time in India, a movement was going on. A movement in Gujarat, the Namirman Andolan against corruption and a movement in Bihar, again against corruption. The corruption even then in India, relative to what was seen in this country, was monumental. And yet the lack of accountability, the impunity with which leaders dealt with these issues, the helplessness of the people, and the completely impotent political process, they made many of us, millions of youngsters in India, extremely anxious, angry and anguished. In many ways, those events shaped the lives of many of us, including me. But for those events, I would not have been in public service as a public official. I would have probably been a doctor, maybe in the area of public health. And yet, when I look back, What's remarkable is the capacity of this system, this nation, to correct distortions, to punish wrongly, and to set things right without too much of fuss. And the incapacity of our system, then and now, to deal with these problems swiftly. In 1977, indeed, the people of India gave an extraordinary verdict, probably unprecedented in the history of mankind. An extremely poor country, an illiterate country, far more illiterate than today, gave a verdict which was unbelievable. We all only dreamed, but we never really dared to hope that that would happen. On the 21st of March 1977, I still remember how we all rejoiced. We danced with glee, with ecstasy, when a mighty dictatorship was felt by the ordinary people in the little polling booths with their little marks on the little ballot papers, as Churchill said. And we all truly thought that India would be transformed. It took only a little while to realize that it was only a change of players, but no change in the rules of the game. Of course, freedom was restored. We were lucky to the next time. But that apart, things remained unchanged. And that really changed my personal journey. When you look back into the history of this country, there were many differences. There were many fights. There were many struggles. 
as I mentioned, probably somewhere in Boston. The first vice president of the United States, Raymond Oren, I think is the name, he killed the first Treasury Secretary of the United States in a duel because of differences of policy. Hamilton, the Treasury Secretary, was a great Federalist. Most of the leaders of the time, they thought of federal government as an evil necessity, as the Tea Party movement now believes. And ultimately, the, the dispute went to an extent where there was a duel, and Hamilton died, injured in the duel. John Adams, the second president of the United States, and Thomas Jefferson, the first president and the author of the Declaration of Independence, they both were not on speaking terms, both were freedom fighters. Both fought long and hard for the goals they believed in. When the Constitution was written, Jefferson was in France as ambassador of the United States. But John Adams was very much here. He became the first vice president and then the president, the second president. And John Adams lost his office in the next election. Jefferson became the president, and Adams could not forgive Jefferson. They had serious ideological differences, not merely a question of ambition. It took them a long time to paper over those differences, and finally they became, after they left the White House, both of them, they became great friends, and both of them curiously died on the same day, on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, on the 4th of July, 1826. Jefferson came from this very state, the state of Virginia. I don't know where he was buried, but I heard. Pardon? This is Yes. I believe there is a plaque there commemorating Jefferson, which says something like this, I'm paraphrasing. Here lies buried the author of the Declaration of Independence the draftsman of the Constitution of Virginia and the founder of the University of Virginia. Nowhere was it mentioned that he was the President of the United States and in fact one of the great Presidents of the United States. And Jefferson himself wrote that. The epitaph was written by him during his lifetime. He never thought that the presidency was important though he was one of the great Presidents and he was celebrated with the wonderful statue on Mount Rushmore. Vijay, when he was uh, making a few interesting remarks, I remember he said at least four times, irrespective of their political persuasion, we welcome all politicians, even if we don't like them. He had to go out of his way to be apologetic about inviting and involving political figures in any kind of public function for a Telugu organization. That's how defensive we are about politics. Instead of making politics a very noble endeavor, we made it shameful and ignoble. The fundamental challenge today really is how to remove this shame in politics and make it again noble. Because Jefferson was a politician. John Adams was a politician. George Washington was a politician. Abraham Lincoln was a politician. Mahatma Gandhi was a politician. So was Sadar Patel, and so were Nehru, and Subhash Chandra Bose, and Prakashan Pantulu, and many others. There was no shame in politics. But today, there is. We all cringe the moment we are associated with politics. We all apologize and say, actually, no, I'm not really a politician. It's accidental. What a disgrace. What a shame. In a true democracy,